Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the lecture. This lecture will be on the basis behind the basic idea behind molecular dynamic simulation and on those factors that govern molecular dynamic simulation. My name is Alessandra Villa, and I work on the Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, in Sweden. So why we would we want to do molecular dynamic simulation or molecular simulation in general? Usually, macromolecules are three-dimensional objects, so we would like to visualize them and also to visualize their motion. And molecular simulation are the best tool to do this. We also like to understand better how molecules interact with each other how an antigen and antibody interact, how the surface model when one come close to the other. Now, simulation can also be used to refine a structure coming from experimental technique or to complement a structural biology experiment, but it can also be useful to refine model coming from docking experiment or, or modeling modeling experiment. Another field where simulation can be very useful is to understand conformational arrangement, mechanisms that govern macromolecules, how a channel open and close, for example, how the ion diffuse along the channel, how a ligand can block or open a channel in this case, for example. Also, simulation allows us to implement small modification residue mutation and see what is the effect on the structure of the system. We usually when we do simulation we try to simplify the system. For example if we are interested in wetting of a surface we will might use one drop of water on a surface to see what happens when the drop of water fall on the surface and so we reduce the system to a dimension that we can simulate. And also here, for example, we can say what is the effect on the wetting mechanism from different uh, type of surface. We change the surface, so we can see how the wetting change. So also from a medical point of view, we can also, so we found ourselves in many cases where we need to simplify the system. If we are interested in, in, in brain injury, or in axonal brain injury, we know that at a um, cellular level, in this particular case, a neuron level, we found that the axon, that is a protuberation of the neuron, get uh, stress. And what happens? So we might, we, c we will address this maybe to looking at the axonal membrane and the mem axolemma to see what happens to the axolemma under stress and at which point of stress, for example, will disrupt. And then will provide us one piece of information about when the axon will disrupt under strain. Of course, our system that we use should be close as possible to what is represented in this case. For example, the lipid composition should resemble the axolemma lipid composition. So the system should be large enough that we don't have size effect. Why simulation? Atom, everything cannot be seen. Why simulation? Atom cannot be seen. Everything we know about uh, biomolecules at the domestic level is a, mo a model. Structural biology structure are all refined using molecular model. And also sometimes we cannot use structural biologic tools for example, a structure cannot be crystallized. A protein is not soluble, so NMR cannot be, a soluble NMR cannot be used. The molecule is very small, so has not enough contrast, so cryo-EM cannot be used. And another aspect is that we cannot measure an energy and dynamics at a domestic level, so we are interested that, in this case, this information can be provided by a molecular simulation. What is the goal of molecular simulation? The goal of molecular 
simulation is to generate enough representative conformation of our system, such a way that a, an accurate value of a property of interest can be calculated. There are several methods that allowed us to generate representative conformation of our molecular system, and one of those is molecular dynamics, and is the method that I will treat in this lecture. So one method to generate conformation is molecular dynamic simulation. Molecular dynamic simulation generate conformation applying the Newton equation of motion. So we start from example from a conformation one at, tem at time t1. We apply the Newton equation that is a relation between the acceleration acting on the particle, the force on the particle and the mass on the particle. And when we get the acceleration, if we know the time interval, we can get the new velocity and we can get the new position of the atoms of the particle. In this way, we can go from conformation 1 at t1 to conformation 2 at time t2, where t2 is equal to t1 plus delta t. And we go on so. In this way, we can generate an ensemble of conformation with a time, also a time dependency. So, as you can see in the, in the, in the movie, all the steps takes place that takes place are very tiny steps. The Newton equation is, as you can see from the expression here, is a second order partial differential equation. So we need it to solve it numerically. The second aspect of this equation, you can see we have the acceleration that is equal to the force acting on the particle and the mass acting on the particle. The mass of the particle of the atoms is known, we, but we need to know the force acting. We can get the force if we know the energy function that government all the interaction in our system. And indeed, known this energy function, the derivative of this energy function is the force acting on the particle. So this is the second ingredient of molecular dynamic simulation, to, be, to have the energy function that describes all the interaction in the system. Before I say that we need to generate enough conformation to be able to calculate an accurate value of a property. Why? So experimental measurements are always done in a macroscopic sample. So usually, in a macroscopic sample, we have a number of avocado molecules. That means 10 of power 23 molecules. And the average that we are doing, we take in the measurement, is an average of all large number of molecules. While in the simulation, we always have one molecule. And we let generate conformation evolving, letting this molecule evolving in time. So how we can combine these two ways? So we go back to the statistical mechanics, and in this context is very important, the ergodic hypothesis. The ergodic hypothesis say that a single system evolving times is replaced by a large number of repli replication of the same system that are considered at the same moment. So that means that the average of a group large number of conformation is equal to the average of the same property in time. And this is valid when the time is infinity. infinite. In our case, we have a defined time, a fixed time. With, when we start a simulation, we will always set how long we will simulate. So we have to be sure that the time that we set is large enough to allow us to have enough conformation that are as representative of our system. And in doing that, we always have to keep in mind that different type of property have different relaxation time. So for some property, you need a shorter sampling time. For other property, you need a larger time, sampling time. And before setting any project, you have to be aware if you can simulate enough time to allow you to get an accurate
property for your system. So here, for example, are some examples of uh, how we can think about on the time and also the times relate smaller system equilibrate faster than larger system for some property. And also this has to be taken into account, for example. One example is uh, diffusion property. In general, if we want to understand the motion of a molecule, a tiny molecule, for example, we might need one microseconds a day. But then if we want not only to understand, but to predict the whole motion of the molecule, or to improve a spirit, then we might need longer time per day. But if at one point we want to get to replace medicine and biology, then we have to go to one million seconds a day. If you think about in the cell, some conformational arrangement happens from one from millisecond to seconds. So then you have to account for this when you think to replace medicine and biology experiment. Of course, that means that before starting a project, you have to see which are your infrastructure and which is the time simulation time that your infrastructure allowed you to perform a day to have a feeling if you can you are able to calculate the property that you want the challenge of molecular simulation so when we simulate a biophysical process we have hundreds of thousands of atoms and those atoms have all intricate interaction that we need to simplify it to have our energy function, but in the same times are very difficult to simplify it. So this is one challenge. The other challenge is that the process, all those processes, range in, have a different range of time scale. We have primary events in the order of picoseconds, but then we have enzymatic and regulatory processes that take milliseconds. And some structural re re rearrangement, reorganization inside the cell might ex exceed seconds. And the third aspect, and not uh, less important one, is that all these old biophysical projects, if you can think, binding, folding, aggregation, are all driven by, by, driven by small force acting one on the other. So it's important that the energy function that we use to describe the system accounts for all this small driving force and is carefully fine-tuned. Now we look what govern molecular simulation. We have the choice that of the degree of freedom and the connect one, the parameter that we use to describe the interaction between those degree of freedom Treatment on non-bonded interaction, boundary condition, integration time stress, temperature pressure, how those are treated, environment, solvent effect, ion, and so on, and where we get the starting. One choice that we can do when we start, or we have to do when we start a simulation, is decide which degree of freedom we want to describe our system. We have different options. We can describe our system one particle, one atoms, so what is called all atom description or atomistic level description. Or we can uh, describe our system in more a uh, grain way. So we describe, we use one particle that define a group of atoms. And uh, so when we go from an atomistic description to a coarse grain description, the number of degree of freedom is reduced and indeed the number of particles is reduced. So it means that you have less particle in the constraint, so you have less interaction to be calculated. There are sometimes techniques that allow you to simulate in at a constraint model and then to go back to the atomistic description with a procedure called back mapping. And sometimes you have also simul multi-scale simulation that allowed you to simulate one aspect in a coarse grain setting and then move back to the atomistic and then going back again. But I'm not part of the topic of this lecture. So when we choose the degree of freedom, so which number of particles, 
that you want to describe your system, it's important that you think about which property are you interested. If you are interested of a general behavior or a more atom atomic-based behavior, if you are interested in atomic-based behavior, you have to use an atomistic model. Once you have choose which model you describe your, you use to describe your system, then you have to choose which energy function I will use to describe all the interaction between those particles. And here in the decision of the energy function, you have to be, it's very important that to consider the reliability of the model that you are using. So one, the model that you choose, whatever the grid of freedom has an energy function, as to encapsulate the property of interest. Second, it, the model should allow you to simulate enough time, uh, uh, so that means that the time that you simulate is larger of the process that you want to investigate, like we were saying enough, and fulfill the ergonomic, ergodic hypothesis. And also you have to pay attention to the size of your system so to avoid that you have a final size effect, so your, your simulation size should be enough to avoid size effect for the property that you are want to calculate. And also consider all the aspects that the simulation, all the aspects of the molecule of the system that you want to simulate. There is a strict relation between how you describe the degree of freedom that you use to describe your system, atomistic or coarse grain, coarse grain, there are different levels, also coarse grain, there are fine coarse grain, there are more grain coarse grain. But anyway, there is a relation and, uh, between how you describe, the experience you know, that you describe your system, the simulation time that you can achieve, and the dimension of the system that you can use. Then we go to the energy function. So you find yourself to choose this energy function that is called also force field. And a, there are several parameters that are inside this energy function. One of the challenge of molecular simulation was uh, to have a simplified model for this integrated interaction. And why we need a simplified model? So this is come from the lecture of the Nobel Prize in 2013, Michael Levitt, when he was say in his introduction lecture that a simplified representation of molecular system should be as simple as possible. The reason why, uh, that I think is applied to any model. And I think the more easy way to understand why is if you think about the weather forecast, you have a model, and the model can be very accurate, very complex, but you have always to keep in mind that you want the weather of forecast of tomorrow, today. So you cannot apply a too complex model that provide you the weather of forecast of tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, because then your results, your prediction, are too old, are not anymore useful. And the same is for molecular model. You want a molecular model that is simple enough so that allowed us to, comp to compute something in a reasonable time. So not in years, but probably in a span of a PhD projects. How they looks like this force field? This force field, these are usually called molecular mechanics force field. When our particle base, all the interaction are interaction between pair particles, usually, and uh, they are divided, the energy function is always defined components that are characterized, char define the bonded interaction and the non-bonded interaction. So the formula that you the, see here is, uh, is a common formula among the atomistic force field used for biomolecules. Each force field is characterized by having analytical function, describe all the type of interaction, and those analytical function most come from classical mechanics. For example, you can see the bonds are exactly an hook potential. 
and then a set of parameters that take in the potential, all the chemical components of your aspect of your atoms. And the other as uh, characteristic of this potential is, like I would say, a, a mainly a pair potential because it's make easy to calculate, calculate pair interaction. There are molecular force fields that might have mixed term or three body term you know, that slow down all the computation. So this force field and molecular force field are usually atomic base. And usually we have diff atom types that describe, more atom types describe the same elements. Depends a lot where this element, in which functional group is this element. For example, an oxygen in an ether group or an oxygen in a carboxyl group might be described by a different atom type. The, there is a strict relation between the parameter and the functional form. So you cannot use this a set of parameters with a different functional form that will provide a wrong results. Also, there is a relation not only between the parameter, the functional form, but also the philosophy that has been used to parameterize the force field. So you cannot take a param parameter from force field A and move to force field B. No. If some parameters are missing in your force field, you need to reparameterize or parameterize those parameters in line with the parameterization strategy of the force field that we are using. The most common biological force field in biomolecular sim simulation are amber, charm, chromos, or PLS, and for the coarse grain setting, Martini force field. And we have also several online server and offline tools that allowed us to parameterize some extra parameter in line with the force field. Where the parameter in the force field come from usually? They can have two different sources. One can be that they come from experimental or ab initio study and uh, or small compounds. For example, bond angle can come from crystal data force constant might come from spectroscopy data, charge might come from quantum mechanic electrostatic potential. Then there is another approach. You don't take directly the, the value from a sperm ab initio study, but you just set the, a fitting procedure to get the best set of parameters that reproduce an experimental value. And this usually is applied if you want to reproduce thermodynamic data or kinetic property. For one example is iron usually are parameterized against not only their structure with water, but also the solvation in water and the exchange with water. Most of the parameterization are done on small model compounds. And one of the property of those molecular mechanics force field that is that parameter developed for a small compound should be transferable to a larger set of molecules. That means similar molecule with similar functional group, also larger set of larger molecules like macromolecules.